Welcome to another edition of Hames Hot Mic, brought to you by Simpson Notaries. I'm very excited to welcome today's guest. She's recently changed the direction of her life in a big way and is now one of two people representing our community as a member of BC's Legislative Assembly. After this quick break, we'll be right back with Kelly Padden, MLA. My guest is Kelly Padden, MLA. I'm particularly excited to have Kelly as one of our MLAs as she brings a long background in the community living sector to the job. Sector provides supports to people with intellectual disabilities and their families in BC. Kelly's worked as a direct support person and for the provincial agency, which oversees a vast network of community-based service providers. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Clint, Gl glad to be here. I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, the first question I think is on, on lots of folks' minds. How have you adjusted? How has the transition, uh, we're, we're talking about transitions in politics now, how has the transition been for you from a kind of a, a regular job to being the MLA? Well, I mean, the MLA is, is I guess a regular job as well, just a little bit different. I've enjoyed the transition has definitely been challenging at times um, highly rewarding and and really engaging um, and I think I think the community and the legislature have both provided um, everything I need to transition well into this role so very very excited to to be getting to work I think one of the questions that's always um, intrigued me or one of the answers that I hope will be intriguing is how's your family dealing with this because this is going from uh, Kelly Patton, who lots of folks know, and you have friends and that, and now it's Kelly Patton in a in a really significant role in the governance of our province. So it's Kelly Patton being a very public figure now. How has that transition been on you and your family? Uh, the family is great. My my family, like I said uh, during the campaign, actually actually were, were really big in encouraging me to, to put my name forward. So they've been really fantastic as far as support. Um, the kids are really interested in seeing what I'm doing and what the job looks like, so they get a little bit of a background view. Um, and my partner is, is really fantastic. I wouldn't be able to do this without, without such a supportive family, so really, really grateful. Having some experience in, in the role of governance, I know that your family really is a part of everything that you do. Um, whether they want to be or not, they're often uh, in that spotlight with you. Now, normally, uh, an MLA would get elected, and one of the first things they'd do is be off to Victoria, and you'd sit in a big crowded room full of a bunch of other MLAs, and you would talk about the, the agenda, and there'd be meetings and that. How is that different right now with the COVID situation that we have in our province? What does it look like now being an MLA? Yeah, I mean, the only differences instead of physically being together in a room we're virtually together so a lot of work being done by our government a lot of discussions and conversations and and meetings um, you know we did sit uh, our first session I attended virtually uh, like most most uh, MLAs and that was different in that I wasn't physically in the space but definitely allowed um, me an opportunity to speak up for for our area um, and allowed me to participate in in that thanks to the hybrid model so um, the difference is is where I'm sitting physically but the work that's being done is still just as collaborative um, and intense probably as as it would otherwise be so does Kelly Padden now have an office in Chilliwack? Is it set up yet? Where Where's the office? Um, how do folks get in touch with you if they have issues they want to chat with you about? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're currently operating our virtual office. So people can reach out uh, by phone or email, the email kelly.padden.mla at ledge.bc.ca. Um, we are working on our physical space. We want to make sure it meets all the needs of our constituents. Uh, first looking for a space in, in Chilliwack, working on that space um, and you know anticipate it being open a little further further out. Uh, and then I'll be taking a look at, at Kent and setting up a space there as well so constituents can access us directly. So my team is, is working hard, um, answering emails, setting uh, meetings and helping people with their issues or answering their questions. So 
And we'll make sure to get that uh, email on the screen. It's probably there already as we speak. Um, so uh, if people need to get in touch with you, they can do it that way. I, I had uh, a chance just very briefly to chat with uh, your uh, colleague, Dan Coulter. He was uh, recording in the studio here uh, a little uh, a message. And I said, Dan, how is it? How's it going with you? And he answered, uh, I think, in one of the most descriptive phrases I've ever heard. He said, well, he said, it's a bit like trying to drink out of a fire hose right now. <laughs> and I thought that pretty much sums it up. How, how are you feeling about those sorts of things? What's the biggest adjustment to, you know, you had a pretty important job before this, or several of them, if you include uh, working at UFV and, and your work with Community Living BC, which I know was uh, a big piece of work. How does this compare and what's the adjustment been like for you? So I think just like a lot of people, one of the biggest adjustments I've actually had to make late, lately, um, I guess, is that I've been working from home since March 2020. Um, so that was with my previous job and, and this role. And like you mentioned, my, my previous role was really, really fast paced, had to be responsive, um, and it was quite a large portfolio. So Dan's absolutely right. Um, we're drinking from a fire hose. I guess I, I was acclimatized to doing that previously <laughs> because, you know, with all the changes uh, due to COVID and supporting the sector I was working in, um, that was also constant. So um, it's the pace is a familiar one, which which is great. Um, and the learning is all new. So that's been really fantastic. One of the things that I really do appreciate is I've come back closer to pe to working directly with people. So I'm hearing directly from individuals and families and business owners. And that was something that, um, you know, I, I wasn't doing in my, in my immediate previous role um, as I was working on policies at a provincial level. So I get the best of both worlds now. So I'll take the fire hose because it's bringing a lot mm -hmm. of good things. Yeah, the learning curve must be uh, enjoyable for someone like you who's spent their life working in those kinds of environments. It's, it must be great to be taking on so much new knowledge. What's the biggest surprise so far? Um, I knew I would like this job. I knew I would be good in this role. Um, I didn't anticipate how much I would love it already. Um, so that, that was an, a very pleasant surprise. Um, and, and I really, I can't say enough about, you know, it, everything feels good. Um, the people in the community um, and, and the businesses in the community are, are supportive. And I just, I really love it. I love waking up every day and being able to represent and serve Chilliwack Kent. I, I su suspect that, that most people who get into the role uh, are, feel a bit overwhelmed, but that they the, the notion that you can get up every day and make a difference in people's lives must be quite rewarding. And uh, that's pretty exciting that you get to do that. Are there any disappointments that you've found so far? Like you thought, okay, it's going to be like this, or <laughs> this is what's going to happen. Is there anything that's been disappointing? Like they didn't give you a, a, a private jet yet, I'm assuming. <laughs> so that's probably... Uh, one disappointment. Is there anything that uh, has disappointed you? Uh, well, the, the private jets are, you know, they're off the table to begin with. So um, I think that, you know, as far as the role is concerned, no, there hasn't been any disappointment. I think me, like, like a lot of people who are working right now and making the sacrifices necessary to keep each other safe, there's times where we want to be in 3D with people. We want to um, be experiencing the place um, at the time. And, you know, the swearing in one, is one of those examples. We, we were able to be sworn in remotely, which was fantastic. And the team that made that happen, uh, I have nothing but respect and gratitude for. But there's something to be said about being in the space. So I am looking forward to when I can safely go to the legislature and just experience being present there physically. Um, that being said, right now, the priority is really on making sure people are safe and healthy and that as we move through the pandemic, that we're doing everything we can. So you had mentioned briefly your previous role and, and how fast things were happening in there. And I, I wanted to touch on this because I think there's a, a group of people in our communities that are a bit underappreciated these days. Throughout the entire pandemic, there were lots of sectors of the economy that were supporting people that had to shut down. And community living, which is supports for adults with developmental disabilities in residential settings and community inclusion programs, that continued through the whole pandemic. There was never a break in those services. And the workers in that sector, I think, um, 
uh, should be held out the way many others uh, have been, and I'm sure you feel that way. They did just an exemplary job of maintaining those very important services through what had to be very, very difficult times. I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely. So there are, one of the things that the, the pandemic has really reinforced is these roles that are so necessary in our community, these roles that make our community work and keep our families and our loved ones safe and healthy and supported, um, they're often not seen. If they're working well, if everything's going well, um, which only happens when, when these frontline workers are doing amazing things the way they do, when everything's going well, we often don't see them. Um, that's important for us to remember and of of all of the things that I'll be taking away and I know a lot of people will be taking away from the experiences during the pandemic is these roles without them I mean we can eas more easily identify them now we can more easily see them and I hope the light stays on um, all of these roles that are so incredibly essential to making our community work and keeping us all safe. Absolutely, and I think some of those folks that are more appreciated than ever were, are in roles that we didn't even think about before. The people that work in grocery stores, the people that work in our um, service industries that provide those things throughout a time like this have shown themselves to be some of the bravest around and some of the most resilient, and I think uh, I know in our family we sure appreciate them and show that appreciation all the time. So um, it's great to hear that. What are the things that are coming to you now from members of the community? What are you hearing from Chilliwack that people are saying to you that's saying, look, I need some help? Uh, where are those areas? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you anticipated some of them and I'm sure some of them were a surprise. What are you hearing from folks in Chilliwack about what they need from the provincial government right now? Yeah, I mean, just like our government people are really focused on the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic on the, their families, their businesses. So uh, primarily we're hearing a lot of questions about, um, you know, how will this service work for me or how will this program work for me? How can I access it? Uh, we're, we're hearing when there's any issue in trying to access any provincial services or programs and happy to help there. Uh, Chilliwack Kent is pretty vast and has, make, is made up of several different communities. And so sometimes there's variation. We're hearing a lot about, you know, my, my loved one is in long-term care and asking questions around that. Uh, you know, we, we're definitely hearing about the, the vaccine plan now um, and, and where do I fit? Where does my loved one fit? And I'm, I'm really grateful. I have a fantastic team who can quickly help people and point them in the right direction. And um, when the issue is larger or requires more work um, or more investigation or, or just a different answer, if, it, if it's quite unique, then you know, we can go directly to the ministries and figure out what's happening in this situation. So um, it really varies. Right now, I, I'd have to say it, it primarily focuses on um, issues as a result of the pandemic or programs and services to support during uh, COVID-19. The, um, the response in British Columbia by the government um, and health agencies to COVID is and continues to be held out as an example for how positive uh, it can be done. I think uh, despite the second wave that we're, we're feeling, uh, we've never been in British Columbia in a position where we feel like things are out of control. People seem to have complied for the most part with, uh, with those regulations. Um, the government should take um, those compliments and, um, and continue to work in, in those directions. Is there a feeling of optimism among uh, the government right now that we're getting really close? Um, how, how, is the, how is the sense uh, of the government? Are we, you know, do we feel like, gosh, we're gonna be months into this? Uh, or is there kind of a growing sense of optimism? What are you feeling about the pandemic at this point as a member of the government? Well, first, I feel incredibly grateful, as does the government, to the public health officials who really have led us through this um, and continue to lead us through this with evidence-based, science-based, um, you know, information <clears throat> and... and um, guidelines and orders. So the government, on the government end of it, I think that there is a feeling of optimism. The vaccines um, really do present a light and, and hope in 2021. 
Um, for myself personally, I, I am aware that, you know, there, there may be the potential to think, okay, we're almost done, we can relax now. And so for me, top of mind is just reminding people that, you know, we can see the end. Um, we can see with the vaccines being available um, to everyone to be vaccinated by the end of September, we can see that timeline in the future. And I know we're tired. I'm concerned that people will relax too soon. So very, very hopeful and optimistic. Also very aware that there, there is that risk. And so um, kind of that double focus there, but it is such good news for 2021. It's looking better, and I think giving people the notion of when vaccines might be a part of their life has uh, has been very positive for folks. People can actually kind of look at the calendar and say, "Okay, I'm, you know, I'm over 60, so it's here, or I'm here, I fit into this group." I think that's uh, that's great. I've noticed um, there seems to be still concern, even though, it, uh, and I'm I'm just going by a layman's look at what I see in numbers and case counts and those sorts of things. There, there's been a bit of a, um, I think a split in some people who think the school system is really safe and it's a, it, you know, and we're not seeing outbreaks in schools and, and it's safe for kids. And then there's other folks who seem to be saying, uh, you know, I'm not sending my kids to school and it's, it, it needs to be done better. And, and I think um, in some respects, I hear from perhaps the BCTF that they'd like to see more done in schools. and and uh, from other folks who say, you know, it's a, it's, we're doing pretty well. What's your sense of where that is headed at this point? Is there anything coming out of policy or government right now that's looking specifically at the school districts? I mean, we're always looking specifically at our schools. Uh, from the beginning, Dr. Bonnie Henry and, and Minister Dix have said that our focus is on um, keeping schools open, keeping health, our health system functioning, um, and being able to be as open as possible with, with our economy um, while keeping people safe. So I think the focus is always on, on these areas and seeing what the evidence is showing us, um, what the information is, is providing. And I know that the public health officials are making decisions based on um, that information, and it's not static. Um, as in, if information is changing, um, and research or or information from even around the world is changing, adjustments are being made, and we've seen that in changes in public health orders, um, in changes in guidelines. So I'm really confident that that's being looked at consistently. As a parent, um, you know, in, there are things that are scary when it comes to our kids. Um, it just adds a little bit extra uh, anxiety, and it's valid. The the concerns, being a concerned parent, is kind of, it's part of the package. And the teachers have been doing such an incredible job keeping our kids safe, um, making sure that they advocate for themselves and for the students. And so I'm really grateful that they're speaking up about their concerns. I'm also very confident that BC has done an incredible job. And, you know, as a parent who I receive exposure letters, um, you know, from the schools, but one of the really incredible things that that I, I'm aware of is, you know, it's it's often, well, so far always, it's been, you know, potential exposure, but no contact. Fraser Health has stepped up so that parents have more information. I think that this is making a really big difference, but I also see the difference it's making for my kids now that they're back in school. Um, it's been a really, really big deal for them as far as mental health. Um, and I'm just, I'm really grateful there are so many people looking at so much information to make sure that our kids are safe. And I'm also grateful for people who are advocating what, what they believe we should be paying attention to. So um, I, I do bring those concerns forward. Um, and, and they're absolutely included in the consideration of the evidence and information, so. I think we're all pretty happy that uh, the government has responded in a way that says we're gonna, we're gonna allow the science to lead and we're gonna look at health professionals and they're the ones who are gonna lead us through this process. There's other examples in the world that I think we're all pretty familiar with where that hasn't been the case and, and I think their countries and areas and regions have paid a price for that. So I think we're all pretty appreciative of the approach that's been taken. And especially in the area of communication because I do believe that 
the communication that's been done by the province has been exemplary in terms of having, um, we can all watch uh, Adrian Dix's hair grow and <laughs> recede, uh, you know, almost daily. And, and that's good. I mean, that um, takes a lot to make that kind of commitment. And I think both he and uh, the public health officials like Dr. Henry have really endeavored to keep us informed. And on behalf of folks in the community, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, we're going to take just a quick break and then we're going to be back and I'd like to talk about some uh, things uh, local, some the relationship with the city and things going on in the city. So we'll be right back with our guest Kelly Padden, MLA, after this message. Welcome back everyone. With me is Kelly Padden, our newly minted MLA for Chilliwack Kent. And Kelly, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. The thing I know is that uh, recently you and our other MLA, Dan, have met with uh, the city. And I know it's part of something the city does when there's new MLAs is to give them a bit of a briefing on comings and goings of things in the city. It makes you, I think, a better MLA to know those things. And they also, uh, undoubtedly, because it happened when I was there, would sort of say, hey, look, if there's some cash hanging around, uh, this is, uh, you know, these are the kind of things we think we're going to need some uh, some help with in the future. Uh, I know that meeting's taken place. Um, what were some of the priorities that you heard from the city that you went, hmm, that's interesting, and you know, I'd sure like to be able to help. How, how do you feel the city and uh, the provincial government can get along in the future? Well, I think that the city and the the provincial government will get along wonderfully because we've got some pretty great relationships there. Um, there, there were definitely some priorities brought up by the city. Uh, one of the, the big pieces is where there's applications for grants. Um, we can look in to see how, how that's moving along, where in the process it is, things like that. Um, I know that one of the, the big priorities from the city was, was the Bradley Centre. Uh, and so Dan and I are both committed to, to following that, making sure that um, th things are, are moving. Right now it's not um, at a place where we can step in directly, but we're just we're, we're waiting because it's going to take a team effort. Um, and so the, the city was really great um, at making sure that we understood where the priorities are, where the, the applications for support to the province have already been made, um, where they, they might be coming in the future. So I think that all of that work, um, you know, it's, it's, it's necessary for us all to be on the same page. And I really, really appreciated mayor and council bringing us up to date um, and, and allowing us to understand where their priorities were. So Ch city of Chilliwack is one of my, um, one of the, the councils that I work with. Um, but, you know, I'm also out in Kent and Harrison Hot Springs. So, um, it's been very, very helpful to, to understand what the asks are of the provincial government. And then I can take that away and see what point we're at, what work's already been done, so that I can take it from there. Have you uh, had a chance to sit down with the uh, District of Kent Council as well uh, and go through the same process? Uh, the process looked a little bit different, but I got all of the information, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. Their priorities, obviously, different communities. It, things differ pretty dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. But the good work that we do in Chilliwack benefits all of Chilliwack Kent, I think. The good work we do in Kent benefits all of Chilliwack as well. So um, I'm just really excited about the fact that, you know, we have amazing leaders here locally and um, amazing councils that we're, we, we can get a lot a lot of good work done. So I'm really encouraged and inspired by, by the leadership throughout the community. So within, within the Chilliwack-Kent riding, there is also a significant number of First Nations, um, Indigenous groups that have gathered together in various, in various ways to organize service delivery. I know that um, Seabird Island uh, has a very significant uh, health component to services they're delivering, as does Sahelis. Is, is Sahelis in your, in yes. Chilliwack, Kent? Yes, absolutely. I thought it was. And of course, Stalo with Yathmeath and the services that they're offering through those. Have you had an opportunity to sit down with Indigenous governments and talk about the role the province may play with them? 
So the answer to that question is some, um, and in various different forms. So um, that's definitely one of the things that uh, we're focused on, is making sure that we are accessible and, and that we connect directly uh, with all the leaders. Um, and you know we're how we are of service and how we can work collaboratively as well. Um, so I've I've met with many of the leaders already. Um, you know through various whether it was group meetings um, or just more casual one on one. Um, and I'm just I'm really really grateful for the time and uh, the energy that's coming from leaders. So over the next uh, few weeks, and then again once uh, we're finished with the next session, that's the top um, the, the top priority on on connecting um, so that we can make sure that we're all working towards the same um, the same goal and that the support needed is there. So I, I know that in times past in in the olden days as I like to call them <laughs> um, the interests of uh, various uh, First Nations organizations wasn't necessarily top of mind for anyone when planning was done. It's good to know that that's uh, more of a consideration these days, especially given that many of them, uh, many of the organizations are developing land and providing housing uh, that is much needed in our community and um, to, their, to their benefit and the community's benefit. So that working together is really, really important. Now, you went into this job, and I remember interviewing you, and you had lots of great ideas, and <laughs> I'm sure there were things that were on your mind that you said, I really want to bring this to Chilliwack. I want, this is something, a legacy that I want to work on to bring to my community. Um, what are those things that you personally really want to get done for this community um, that you're working on, that you uh, really feel passionately about? So that's a really great question. Thank you for asking. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, I mean, there are some obvious infrastructure, um, you know, that, that needs to be done here. There, there is a very desperate need for safety and mental health um, supports. But I think that at the center of all of the ideas or priorities that I have is I want Chilliwack Kent and all the people in Chilliwack Kent to feel like they are absolutely represented, that their voice is included and that they have access to their representative in Victoria. Um, it's not an easy thing to try to achieve just by the nature of the population, um, you know, we have, there are a lot of differences. There's definitely more ways that we're alike than different across Chilliwack Kent, um, but there are impactful differences. So making sure that everyone is included in the voice that I get to carry to Victoria, making sure people feel like they have access to a responsive MLA who cares about their needs and their priorities and their family. So you said, uh, and you kind of glossed over it. You said there's all kinds of infrastructure, and then you went into uh, the other things. What's the infrastructure that you think our community needs? I mean, if I think we could come up with a list that would never end <laughs> um, if the money did the same. So right now, I know, uh, for example, the, the Bradley Center, that's a project that the city's working on. I understand that in Kent, they're looking at um, recreation facilities. I know that our Indigenous communities, um, some are in need of community centers, um, cultural centers. I know that up in Cultus Lake, they, they really need um, waste management. And then there's our trails and our parks and our roads. Um, so there are communities who are struggling with, with um, you know, roads that, that need to need to be improved or or weren't intended for the growth that's now happened. Um, utilities that we could shore up. Um, there's so much growth happening that the infrastructure really is varied. And you know, there's brid the bridge, um, the Agassiz Rosedale Bridge, that absolutely needs you know, attention and there's there's plan, like planning for that. Um, but how does that happen and how does it impact people while it's happening? There's so many questions and the variety is, is unending. Um, so there, and then, you know, there's environmental concerns and how infrastructure uh, relates to that. Um, and th it's unending. 
And that's fantastic. There will, yeah. I will always have something important to be doing for Chilliwack End. I don't think you'll ever get a point where you'll sit down and say, okay, that's all done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah. uh, because it, there's an, a, an endless bucket of need, I used to say, in infrastructure projects, as you have described. I know uh, certainly in the District of Kent, the, the, um, they're looking at recreation facilities, especially swimming pools, which yeah. relate directly to having lots of things for young folks to do, which relate directly to when they don't have lots to do, they can tend to get into trouble. And so there's all kinds of uh, exciting things that you can work on on behalf of the community. And and uh, it's nice to know that, uh, that you were there and that you see those things and can articulate them because we want you to succeed. If you succeed, then we succeed. So uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, in your endeavors and come back and uh, and chat anytime if there's anything that you uh, want to get a message out about that's great or if you've done something that I think people should uh, hear about I'll certainly give you a call as well so all right uh, thank you so much Kelly for spending some time with us today it's been it's been great and uh, we with you wish you as I said and your family nothing but luck as you move forward in this new endeavor in your life great well thanks so much Clint Thanks so much for joining me in another episode of Hames Hot Mike. As always, if you have comments on the program or thoughts on guests or political issues you'd like discussed, send us an email. Thanks very much for watching.